sorry, not live, but re recorded, uh, recorded and posted after. Awesome. So I think we're ready to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here today. Um, it's really great to see you. And on behalf of uh, Meaningful Work, I'd love to welcome you to our launch event, Impact Unleashed. Um, after a year of building a team, a platform, and amazing connections, this is really the culmination of that effort. So extremely grateful that you're with us here today. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the land upon which I am speaking today, uh, which is the stolen and unceded territory of the Slavitooth, Lumi, Mosaic, Katsi, Stolo, and Semiamu First Nations. And I'd like uh, each of us all today just to take a moment and reflect um, upon the land that you are located today and what acting towards reconciliation, uh, what acts towards reconciliation you can take moving forwards. Just a bit of housekeeping and accessibility. Uh, we have uh, live closed captionings that are available. So if you go to the Zoom settings, you can uh, go to the CC button here and you can show your subtitle or uh, view the full transcript later as well. Um, so feel free to toggle that as you need. And um, that's available in the Zoom settings again. Uh, if you have any issues, please uh, throw it in the chat and, and we can help you with that. Uh, we encourage you to keep your camera on and engage, uh, especially during the Q&A. However, you may also turn your camera off, eat lunch, uh, be comfortable, whatever, whatever you need to, to feel comfortable today. Uh, we will also be recording the session. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please do turn off your camera. And um, please say hi in the chat. Uh, feel free to uh, introduce yourself and your organization. i um, love to get to know all of you. Um, we'll have, uh, I'll talk about it a bit more on the agenda, but we'll have, we'll have some time to, to, to meet everyone as well at the end of the event. And uh, when we say nonprofit in the event, we are referring to registered charities, registered nonprofits and other non -for, not for profit initiatives. So please do not feel excluded when, when we use that term. Awesome. Uh, welcome. Welcome everyone. Keep it coming. So the agenda for today is I'll talk a bit about meaningful work and our story and then move on to the topic of digital transformation or thriving in a digital world. Um, we'll move on to our expert panel discussion, uh, which I'm really excited for, move on to some Q&A where uh, members of the audience can uh, ask questions either in the chat or just by turning on your camera and asking a question. And then we'll talk a bit about skill-based volunteering and, and the platform and and, and next steps uh, for all of you. And at the end of it, uh, feel free to stay and, and chat and, and we have a, we'll have a little informal session to, to get to know everyone uh, who wants to linger on a bit longer. Meaningful Work started in February, 2020, when a few of us realized the need for a more connected community where companies and individuals could better support nonprofits, find their own social purpose and create a deeper impact. Of course, you all remember that the very next month, the pandemic hit North America, and that need that we discovered became even more important. We start off at the SFU Venture Connection Incubator, where we assembled a team of change makers from diverse disciplines. And we ran our first pilot in July of 2020, when we were able to match about 20 volunteers and 20 nonprofits, and including one company, Sage, to engage in what they were good at. Since then, we've been able to build a smart online platform uh, to help volunteers find their perfect opportunity and for nonprofits to recruit high quality individuals and companies to engage their employees in community impact. Uh, we've had over 45 nonprofits join our beta and currently have over 60 volunteers from five companies and two professional networks, and we're really excited to grow. Our story has really been one of adapting to the digital world. Um, most of our team had never actually met in person until we were allowed to when, when restrictions, restrictions lifted a little bit over the summer. All of our activities from marketing, sales, operations, human resources have been online. Um, and just the way that we interact with each other is so different from the way we had imagined it to be. And that brings us to the topic of digital transformation. There are many ways in which it can touch your organization 
and each organization has different needs and goals. If you go department by department, we can see opportunities for digital transformation everywhere. If you look at marketing, uh, there's a great opportunity in digital advertising, lots of various ad credits available around that. Um, being able to segment your market more accurately um, and look at uh, optimizing your website and landing pages. Uh, with HR, of course, we have the rise of virtual offices, new challenges in terms of engaging employees, as well as trying to tackle equity, diversity, and inclusion um, online. From our operations, we see new business models coming up, uh, ways to really uh, accurately and with detail measure your client's experience by even being able to see step-by-step step how they walk through your website, for example, as well as online program delivery. Finally, technical infrastructure, um, being able to access employee data, client data, donor data, and, and looking at cybersecurity from a critical lens. With finance and fundraising, there are new donor channels, gamification, cryptocurrency, and, and so many opportunities in the space as well uh, to go digital. And finally, with impact measurement and communication, uh, lots of value in digital storytelling, coming up with new ways to tell your message uh, and communicate your impact, as well as new ways to measure your progress and, and set, set key performance indicators. Um, so before we continue, I, I'd like to engage you all with some quick polling questions just to see where we're at um, as a group. So um, Aaron, feel free to, to start the poll. Um, so the, the first question is, um, how would you best describe yourself? Um, please select all that apply. I guess you can see the whole poll at the same time. So yeah, feel free to, to fill that out. Um, yeah, so where have you had success in implementing digital strategies? And where do you think you need the most work in terms of your digital strategy and finally, where would you rate yourself um, as an organization um, from on a scale of one to seven? Awesome. So I think we can um, maybe end the poll here. And I'm just going to share the results. Um, so we have many people in the nonprofit uh, sector as executives or team members, um, a, a good mix of everyone, really, uh, employees and students and individual volunteers. Of course, everyone here is an amazing human. Uh, where have we succeeded? So I think marketing has been a point of success, uh, followed by operations and then human resources. Uh, and where do uh, implementations uh, need the most work? Again, we see finance and fundraising and impact measurement and communication. So um, that, that's great to have that insight there. And on a scale of one to seven, I think most people are out of five, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, and some people from a, a good range for sure in terms of where your organization is at. Cool. So um, thanks for, for sharing the results, uh, uh, sharing your, your insights there. I'm just going to close the poll. Now, we talked a bit about what digital transformation looks like, but I'd like to talk about why it's important. Um, it can lead to resilience and flexibility in your organization, can expand your audience and, or increase the value that you can deliver. And it leads to being able to scale your impact at a national or a global level. However, it is expensive 
um, there's a steep learning curve and it's hard to find talent uh, that can really execute on your digital strategies. And it requires constant building, updating and optimizing your systems. So without further ado, I'd like you to introduce you to our panel of industry experts. Today's discussion will be moderated by Li Ju Huang, our Di Director of Business Development. And I'll let you take it away, Li Ju. Sweet, thank you so much, Raj. I'm gonna be completely honest. I am so nervous. I didn't expect so many of you guys to be here today. I think we're at 45 participants, which is just mind blowing because I've run digital events before and workshops and we don't hit this kind of numbers. So I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, hello, my name is Lee Ju Huang. I'm one of the co-founders of Meaningful Work and Director of Business. Uh, joined here with me today, we have Kyle, um, co-founder and Director of Finance, Director of Finance and Fundraising at Starfish Canada. Um, we have Rochelle, Executive Director from Spark Foundation, and Lisa, CEO of Orvis Canada, joining me today on a topic of achieving digital transformation. Um, what I'm gonna get, uh, what I'm gonna get my panelists to do, starting from Kyle to Rochelle and to Lisa, is to please introduce yourself. Great, thanks, Liju. Uh, hello, everyone. It's great to see uh, many new and familiar faces. Uh, my name is Kyle and Bringham. I use he/him pronouns. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Starfish Canada uh, and the director of, of finance and fundraising. Uh, we started the Starfish Canada out of one simple idea that we know that young leaders aren't, young people aren't just the leaders of tomorrow, they're also the leaders of today. That young people have great ideas and innovations and insights and these ideas are things that can help us uh, get out of some of our big environmental challenges. Uh, and so we educate, engage, and inspire young Canadians to take part in environmental solutions. And I'm really excited to be talking to you today about how we've sort of changed a bit of the landscape uh, for ourselves over the last year. There's been a lot of hardships and a lot of um, opportunities and rewards um, by being able to pivot and really lean into digital transformation. So very excited to share our story with you today. Thank you. Sweet, looks like I'm next. Hey everyone, my name is Rochelle, she and her pronouns, and I'm currently calling in from the unceded and traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. I'm also the ED CEO and founder of Spark Foundation, where we ignite points of change one spark at a time by empowering the next generation, specifically grades three to grade 12 students on subject matters such as life education. So it'll look like workshops, camps, currently all online and remote and community engagement events. We really just instill really good morals and values into young people to make sure, number one, they get life education and they're able to build those soft skills as well as give back to their community. And I'm looking forward to sharing more stories and experiences with y'all and learning with you. Hi there, I'm going to say hello and then turn my camera off because I'm having some uh, internet issues today, I'm sure something experienced by all. Um, my name is Lisa McKean. Um, I'm currently the CEO of Orbis Canada. Orbis Canada is part of Orbis International, an international NGO with a mission to end avoidable blindness globally. I've spent almost my entire career in the nonprofit space, working in both the US and Canada and consulting with um, many charitable sectors, including health, education, sports, social services, and the arts. Um, as I'm sure you might imagine, the incredible evolution um, that charities, nonprofits have moved through pre and post internet, um, social media, social enterprise, it's been, it's been quite the journey. And taking the donor community along that journey has evolved as well. And right now we find ourselves um, in, in this present moment, mid pandemic, probably the most disruptive operating environment ever experienced. And the full impact of that disruption has caused, I believe for many people on the call, a deep reflection and reassignment of priorities, um, many of them around the digital space. Um, so it's, you know, it's at that intersection that movements like meaningful work, I think will play back into um, to building a healthy, unified um, charitable sector in Canada. 
Thank you, panelists, for introducing yourself. It's funny because as a startup, we kind of started from home and then you know the pandemic hit and we've been home ever since. And we've like as Raj mentioned, we've never been in person or had an office space to work out of. I'm quite curious. Uh, how has your organization adapted your program to deliver in digital formats? And I'll start with you, Kyle. Great, thank you. Um, so the first thing I'll say um, and uh, is that adaption for us uh, looked quite different, I think, from a lot of places. We are a predominantly online organization here at the Starfish Canada. Our board has uh, had a national uh, representation. Um, um, a lot of our employees and interns do as well. And so for that reason, um, we adapting looked a little different. We do run educational workshops in Ontario. And so because of that, those necessarily had to pivot, like uh, I'm sure the Spark Foundation and other places certainly have had to do as well. However, um, we were well set up uh, for some success. So I think, you know, we were, um, we had that um, opportunity in front of us. Um, but what we did find is that, of course, it's not just enough to like buy your Zoom subscription and to be able to say like, great, now we're digital. There's, as uh, Raj mentioned in the intro there, there's so many different ways in which um, intersections in which all of our work, um, if as we needed to pivot to, to online things, and, uh, needed to take space. And so for us, a lot of it was HR related, trying to make sure that we can do right by the people who are our volunteers, our interns, trying to make sure people feel supported um, as they work at home from a computer screen. And those things are not, as we know, they're, they're complex. Uh, they're not as simple as sometimes sending a little care package here and there. There's, uh, it, it requires regular check-ins and in, in space in order to make sure that we're doing the right things. Um, so I think it's been, we've had an, um, we had good opportunity, but it's, I don't think we were uh, by any stretch immune to some of the challenges uh, that we would uh, face over time. Seems like we've lost Rochelle for a bit, but Lisa, uh, why don't you take a, take that question on uh, how you guys have adapted to um, program delivery to digital formats. Sure. Um, a few ways. I mean, for, we've, for a number of years, we've utilized digital platforms for both awareness building and fundraising. Obviously, we had to, um, as everyone did, um, deal with adapting to um, living through a Zoom room. Um, I think what's changed the most is the intensity and the scrutiny with which we're undertaking that digital activity. Um, you know, where we would have done two or three digital campaigns in 2019, six in 2020, and now 12 in 2021. So just the volume alone, um, but also just a deeper analysis, segmentation of data, um, looking more closely at what our donors care about, how they behave, et cetera. So um, for whatever reason that wasn't happening before, largely capacity, I think the biggest thing that we did um, in terms of uh, adaptation was we transformed a national face-to-face -face event into a virtual experience that was highly successful. Um, that was probably the highlight of the pandemic here for us. Um, and, and we co-created that with the, with the corporate sponsor FedEx. Um, and at the end of the day, we had a happy partner and um, you know, a large participant base. So very happy with that. That's it. Hey, welcome back, Rochelle. Uh, the question is, how have you adapted your program delivery to digital formats? Yeah, sure thing. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, for Spark Foundation, we had our workshops in person, our overnight camps for high school kids in person, and all of our community engagement events, like many of our nonprofits in this room today, were all in person. And saying that as soon as that March inquiry came out for basically Canada, our nonprofit had to pivot within a couple of days, phone those parents, redo our policies as most of us had to, or enhance them and bring everything online as fast as we could, um, keeping member retention in mind. So the three largest changes for us when it came to transforming into a digital format was relearning our programs in an online world. Like that interaction, that human interaction, how do we get kids to still be in love with what we teach them and interact and 
how to use Zoom and what is better, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, or whatever it may be. So relearning these things and our staff were all in the age of 25 and saying that young people are deemed to be most of them go-getters and <laughs> keeping in that mind, we were very quick and able to turn around that experience. So for us, it was definitely a large hurdle trying to move everything online. In saying that, we also learned a lot along the way, as I'm sure a lot of you have as well. And one of the things being creating portals such as volunteer portals and workshop sign-up portals and uh, different Instagram marketing campaigns and just learning how to really hone that online space. Thanks, Rochelle. It's quite insightful. Lisa, you've mentioned that you were able to transform a face-to-face -face event um, with, with the help of FedEx. And, and, and I'm just guessing a little bit, I've done some research into your organization and, and, I'm, and I'm just guessing it, that may be pull for sites. Is that right? And if so, yes. I'd love to learn more on how you worked with corporate partnerships to make that face-to-face um, -face event a reality um, with, with their support. Sure. Plain Pull for Sight is our signature event. It happens in Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver, um, where teams of 20 um, pull a plane across the tarmac. Go figure. They love it. Um, and it's, it's a big, um, there's a lot of other activities on the day. It's not just that. So it's a fundraising opportunity. But for FedEx, it is our number one employee engagement program. So um, one of the big things that we had to do figure out right from the get-go, because this, this happened, you know, just right upon the, the shutdown when we realized that there was just no way we'd be face-to-face. -face. And it was a matter of um, meeting with FedEx and finding out what was the most meaningful for them. And the most meaningful for them, because it is their employee engagement number one activity, is that whatever it was going to be would need to be experienced by teams at the same time. And at that time, other charities had done things around events like um, for runs and, and stair climbs and stuff, you know, assigned, a, go, go do it, come back and report about it, you know, blog about it, whatever. We couldn't do that. So very early, we had to figure out something that was going to be engaging in a Zoom room um, for teams to be able. So it ended up being some pre-produced combination of pre-produced video. Um, we have a flying eye hospital at Orbis, and it was a, a flight, a simulated flight on the, on the hospital with in the middle um, a, a big segment of live entertainment. So team trivia and um, puzzle so solutions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finishing off with landing back at um, the airport. So it was, like I said, it was a win for all, but it did take um, a lot of back and forth with, with the corporate partner. Um, to ensure that we were meeting um, ultimately their top priorities. Yeah, before this call yesterday, uh, I, I definitely spent some time looking at some of your YouTube videos. I mean, it looks really engaging and exciting. Hopefully one day Meaningful Work can partake in that too. Um, Kyle, I know you've, you've, you've mentioned student interns. Um, and I'm sure you've, you were able to leverage a lot of skilled volunteers and uh, and professionals in the past as well, as far as, as far as I'm aware. Would you be able to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this was our advantage over the last year. That's because people, I think a lot of people understood the Surfish Canada as a predominantly online organization. One of the things that we did in March um, is that we put out a call for volunteers really quick, um, actually, as, the, um, as news came in that we would be working from home. Um, and so because of that, we actually had, uh, I think it was in six weeks, we onboarded 120 volunteers. As a sidebar, that's an insane amount of people in a short amount of time. Don't do that. But nonetheless, it was a really cool story to be able to tell. Um, a part of what um, that led us to be able to do is, A, first off, our capacity overall was expanded. And so we were able to have a lot of new writers and editors for our editorial program. We actually onboarded some directors to help support coach and mentor some of the other people in our organization. Um, but even, so first off, we were able to, yeah, do better in the work that we do because there were a lot of people who just wanted to volunteer some time in that moment. And we understood that that was going to be a thing and we wanted to provide people with valuable opportunities where we could. Um, and from a strategic perspective, and this is in terms of priority, it was down the, down the line um, or down the priority list, but um, certainly important, is that it created this piece of demand in our organization. 
And so when I went uh, speaking to corporate partnerships and granting and all those sort of things, it gave us space to go knock on doors and be like, so we've got a lot of demand right now um, and we kind of need to be able to keep that work going. How can you support this work? Um, there was one organization I said, um, what I, we need like $6,000 and they said, we'll give you 50, uh, which is, a, <laughs> I've, I've never had that happen before in my lifetime as a fundraiser. Um, but it was a really cool story because again, we had, there was a demand that was there. We had skilled volunteers who were doing some incredible work. We figured out how to track that. And then um, in order to make sure that we could continue doing that, uh, we tapped on the right shoulders in order to make it happen. So um, it's been a really great success story in a time um, where I'm sure with a lot of nonprofits and including us, we were a little scared about what the outcome could potentially be. Thanks, Kyle. It sounds like, wow, that's, that's, a, that's an amazing amount of volunteers you guys, you guys were able to recruit over, over the summer. 120. Oh, like, it was in six weeks uh, and it was like March to April. It wasn't even, the summer was oh, that, <laughs> Yeah, that must have been quite a lot of, you must have been flipping a lot of pages. Like I can't imagine going through all that and just getting them all on board. And on, on, on top of that, managing them, that, that's a tough pace. So mm -hmm. good on you. You have my applause. Um, Rochelle, I was looking at your board of directors and you seem to engage a lot of skilled volunteers yourself, um, people that come from um, a variety of expertise. Tom, could you tell me a little bit more about how you engage them and how they support um, the work that Spark, Spark Foundation is doing? Yeah, for sure. At Spark, our board is a working board, meaning that when we do have a community event or a conference now online or a workshop, or anything in general, a care package um, event, they are there and they're there to support, supervise, hand out coffee, tea, wherever it may be. Um, that's one way we do engage our working board. But also when it comes to recruiting on the flip side, we do have the ability to reach out to amazing organizations such as Meaningful Work. And we've been able to recruit two board members from Meaningful Work, as well as our other board members come from just community events that we've done and they stepped in and said hey how can i be more involved and we asked them right on the spot what do you think about this and they're like yes be there tomorrow and that's how we normally get our board members just from them being way way like almost overly involved in our work and slowly working their way up to be an advisor or a board member thanks rochelle it sounds like you're really um, well, one thanks for the shout out but also it seems like you're really getting the value of uh, your skilled volunteers I'm, I'm quite curious. I've run nonprofits myself and I know, you know, much like a startup, you're wearing multiple different hats. Um, you're all over the place. You're, you know, at one minute you're, e uh, you're answering emails and, and the next you're, you're, you're at your fundraising event or uh, you're answering a call from a potential partner. I'm quite curious, you know, I, I found that skilled volunteers were able to really help me out and being able to, um, fill in some of the gaps or wear some of the uh, hats when when I wasn't able to totally be present. So Lisa, I'm quite curious, um, and I'm not entirely sure if you guys have skilled volunteers, but um, aside from the support um, and also um, the extra hands that you get um, operationally, uh, what kind of value, um, if you're able to put it monetarily, are, are they able to contribute? Um, into your organization. So perhaps um, maybe you're able to uh, get some support on marketing consulting um, through a skilled volunteer. And, and how much does that save your nonprofit time, energy, and money? Wow. Um, good question. It, right now, um, we, I, we created an advisory board with no governance accountabilities. Um, and that gave us the ability to recruit sector expertise, skill sets that we needed for, for various things. And those members could stay for a project or they could stay for a number of years if what they brought to the table was relevant for a longer period of time. I found that to work extremely well. But we too are a recent beneficiary of a wonderful resource from <laughs> Meaningful Work and, and very excited about that. It's not just about the, the monetary value, it's about the professional development for staff it's, and where that leads to. It's about, it, it's never just about the product or the project or the thing. It has far reaching impact. 
Um, but the kind of work that we're doing, we're going to do with, um, with our Volunteer for Meaningful Work, um, I think will absolutely change the way we think about digital marketing and gamification. 100%. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a, you know, when we, when we first uh, started um, getting volunteers, it was a lot of, it was a lot of playing catch up for nonprofits, not all, but for some. And, and I think some of the more popular projects was helping some nonprofits, especially revamp their website. Um, at, well, at one point it wasn't as, you know, as important, but once we moved digital, it became kind of the front facing thing on the, on the web. So that's really great. Um, Kyle, I'm going to come back to you. Um, you've mentioned a little bit about around fundraising and also um, talking to companies and, and asking for um, asking some asking for funds to support projects. Uh, what do corporate partnerships look like for you? And has that changed due to the pandemic? It's a fantastic question. I don't um, so I'll, I'll talk to one unanticipated, unanticipated strategy. Is that a strategy if I didn't think of it ahead of time? I don't know, but it is a thing that happens. So I'm going to speak to it. Um, one of the things that we have and one of our flagship programs is our top 25 environmentalists under 25 program every year. As it sounds like we award 25 people who are doing really great work uh, with an award. Uh, that award also comes with a program where they get to choose their own adventure. Would they like mentorship? Are they looking for funding opportunities? Are they looking for jobs? What sort of things can we do to help accelerate the next stage in their career? Um, one of the things we did is we piloted a mentorship program over the pandemic, realizing that there was connections to be made. It was harder to do networking in online space. And if there was a way we could facilitate that, that it could do us uh, and them a world of good. Um, focus on them. I wanted to do them uh, a lot of good uh, through the nature of things. And what happened uh, was that we were able to secure a lot of really great mentors from a lot of different businesses, um, which um, we were being intentional about diversifying and making sure we found the right fit for them. And a part of that was that there were a lot of companies that came in. And actually, through engaging uh, with the right employees through a mentorship program, um, a lot of them came back and said, could we actually talk about like doing something a little bit more? Uh, could we do something a little bit better with you? Um, because this went well uh, and we want to just figure out how to how to keep this going. And so there actually are multiple corporate partnerships, which are in the late stages of confirming right now for multi-year funding um, because of the fact that they just engage with our, our mentorship program as a starting point. And so I think that there's where it feels appropriate and right, um, you know, what we've learned over the pandemic um, is to figure out what people need um, and to be able to deliver on that. Uh, and to find the right ways to connect people together. Um, and sometimes I think one of our um, our trepidations is that that sometimes feels like almost non-strategic, like you're not gonna be able to quite point to an outcome. You kind of hope that something comes down the line, um, but it's hard to really navigate like right fit. And if you shouldn't do something because there's no direct revenue associated with it or you know things of that accord. But I think the more you can connect people together with a really great program sort of embedded and, and tied in there, uh, there's a sweet spot in there where if you just, if you have the ability to be patient and, and wait for a right opportunity, sometimes uh, you'll find some really great uh, things that can, that can come from that. So that was a part of our strategy and, um, and where we've seen success over the last year. Sounds great. It sounds like by cultivating relationship with corporate employees, you're able to build out long-term relationships um, with companies to uh, build a new um, avenue for potential funding. So that's really exciting, Kyle. Congratulations. Rochelle, I saw you nodding your head a little bit while Kyle was talking. And I know you, you guys have been fundraising a little bit as well. Um, we, we see you all the time um, as, as another uh, client of SFU Venture Connections. Would you like to uh, speak on this topic a little bit? Sure thing. And Kyle just hit it right on the nail. It was, it's all about, yes, strategies are definitely amazing to have, but within the pandemic and within the adaptability season we've all been through, it's, it's about hitting one or two goals and working along our new strategy as we go along, creating that new path and saying that for Spark, our corporate partnerships 
we're really all about empowering the next generation through programming. So physical workshops, physical camps around the campfire um, in that nature for young people. And when the pandemic hit, our nonprofit pivoted to move quality education into resources such as building care packages for low-income families or providing frontline meals, meals to frontline workers, et cetera, and really demonstrating life skills and passion work through that for kids to safely volunteer, et cetera. So when that change did happen, our corporate partners from before, especially locally, we had to sit down and have a hearty conversation with them and say, hey, we are in this stage together. We are in this as a team. You've seen the work we've done. We're both empowered people. How are we going to move forward? So it's about the collaboration piece to see where your corporate partner is, where you are as a nonprofit. And that's what we were able to do and vision out our work together, as in where can we pivot all of our resources that we've compiled together to the next project. And for example, that's one of the projects that came out, which was also co-founded by the Canada Red Cross, which was 800 career packages, 300 meals. And it was just solely used to safely working on these projects and really helping our community of Surrey. Thanks, Rochelle. That's very insightful. Uh, Lisa, I was going to ask the same question, um, especially, you know, Orvis Canada being a little bit older. Um, I believe you guys became an affiliate member of Orvis International in 18, uh, 1984, but we do have a question from the audience, Chuck, um, that I'm going to ask. And Chuck asked, Lisa, you, you've mentioned uh, how you have ramped up your digital campaign seemingly exponentially. Do you have any concerns about losing your message or fatigue with that volume? Yes, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I think that obviously the magic is always making everything a little bit different, customized to a unique audience or understand who you're communicating with. So not all of those would have been designed for the same audience. Um, and some of them would be reflective of the giving patterns um, of the past for some and, and others. Um, but yeah, no, that's a, that's a very, very good question and something to be, um, you know, regarded very carefully as one embarks in this space. I think we had enough material to work with that we felt like we weren't running too thin and creating too much replication across uh, our particular grid. But thanks for the question. Well, maybe I'll segue into the question that I, I wanted to ask Lisa is, is uh, being a bit of an older um, nonprofit and, and, and likely have already built it. I was well, ready I for the older me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not trying to date you at all, none at all. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, having have built that relationship um, much early on and then having gone into COVID, how has that corporate partnership uh, looked like and how has that changed? So, yeah, well, let's just get that on the table. I am the elder on the panel. <laughs> happily so um so i think i think um the, the biggest impact we saw with with corporate partners really happened on a global level where it was related more to program delivery so when you have a flying eye hospital that's funded by boeing fedex etc and the, that hospital can't fly anymore they had to create the same thing that we did with our face-to-face -face events, they had to create virtual interpretations of that training and make it as impactful as possible to keep those relationships whole. And that has been an ongoing and will continue into this year. Um, for us in Canada, FedEx is our key um, corporate partner because we don't until this year um, do any domestic work um, it's, it's tricky sometimes finding a, a, a large group of corporates that are, are interested unless that is part of their, um, their pillars of support, the international work. But we will be working with First Nations communities starting this fall in remote areas, um, bringing a new AI technology. Um, it's basically the Orbis rem remote medicine um, model because in some parts of Canada, um, and communities, it is very much the same. Um, and taking care of a, a diabetic retinopathy issue, which is just uh, rampant right now. And so we probably will have a lot more corporate uh, participation, but we really haven't today. Just FedEx for the most part. Thanks, Lisa. 
AI, that sounds fascinating. I, I haven't heard of any nonprofits yet working with AI. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what that looks like. Um, we're almost coming to a close. I, I love to give the audience a chance to ask any questions. Um, as Raj has mentioned, you can, you can type it out in, in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions for Lisa, Kyle, or Rochelle. As you can see on my timer right here, it says we have 30 seconds left, but not to worry. Uh, we're happy to take some of the questions and then afterwards uh, we'll, we'll move forward from the panelists uh, back to Raj. So I have to do this thing where I'm like, we're going once, we're going twice. And we're sold. Um, it sounds like I, I, you, Lisa, Kyle, Rochelle, thank you so much for being a panelist today. I think you guys did a wonderful job, an awesome job answering all my questions, hence why I don't think there were a lot of questions today from the audience. Um, again, thank, thank you all for being here and thank you to the audience uh, for uh, listening to our panelists. Um, it's really exciting for the work that you guys are doing and, and, I, and I look forward to keeping up to date with um, the work that you guys do and, and, and especially seeing how especially seeing how you guys weather throughout the pandemic and as, and as we go into uh, back into in-person. So thank you, panelist. Raj, um, that's all from me. I'll send it back to you. Well, uh, sorry, could I interrupt for one moment, please? Um, Precious, did you have a question that you wanted to ask right before we move on? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, um, did I miss I someone? Did. Yeah, feel free to just, uh, just you can just chat uh, or talk and speak. Um, hello, sorry, I joined a bit late and maybe you guys covered this, but um, I am working with an organization in Kenya. Uh, it's called Impact Africa Network. So it's a startup studio in Nairobi uh, that is on a mission to ensure like young talented Africans take part in the digital transformation of Africa. And we, well, we, are, not, we are a nonprofit company. And so we've been looking at Canada in terms of like the philanthropist in Canada, but we've not had like a lot of luck on that area. So I'm wondering um, if any of you guys maybe talked about it, if you can just, you know, like give me some advice that I can take back to my organization. Thanks, Precious, for your for your question. Um, I so yeah, I think there's so what I've I've seen in this space. I've actually been on the board of um, what I'll call like an international development oriented organization, and so a lot of what they do um, is about resourcing to uh, other countries. Uh, and so there, I've seen a lot of different um, models in this space. Um, I think overall, what I would say certainly is that if um, and maybe this is a part of what you've done or what you've considered, but if there's a way to find um, an organization in Canada that's, that's mission or mandate as a charity is to provide resourcing to uh, in a, a space that's similar to yours. Sometimes those collaborative partnerships can be really beneficial and help access a lot more opportunities, especially in Canada. Um, as an example, from what we've been able to do, um, we've given, we've been the financial agent for um, young people who don't have charitable status for their organization, because that's often a very taxing and cost thousands of dollars in order to actually like apply for charitable status meaningfully. And so through that, we've been able to uh, accept money for other organizations because we share similar mandates and then be the financial agent for them. That I would say something around that space might be advantageous for, uh, for yourself. Um, and I can even connect you specifically to the uh, Community Empowerment Foundation uh, that I was with. I, I couldn't guarantee anything, of course, but uh, I think something of that accord um, might uh, open up more opportunities for yourself. Thank you so much. That sounds like a perfect idea for me. Yeah, to add on. Thank you. To add on to that, one uh, aspect that a lot of people sometimes um, overlook or maybe even sometimes forget about is your local MLA or MPs. They're like a resource hub, a resource bank for connecting you to local nonprofits or just anyone who wants to help make a difference in the community that you're situated in. So Precious, 
feel free to reach out to your local MP, um, member of parliament or your MLA uh, in your writing and they would be more than happy to point you to your neighbor who probably runs something or down the street. Um, a lot of times we're not aware of who is doing what. So they're really good resources as well to connect you. Thank you so much. I think, I think that's one thing that we did not consider. We might actually be able to do that. Thank you. The, the other thing, one last note on um, another resource for you would be the country desks at the federal government um, for the area that you're looking at. They can be a great resource as well. Uh, in terms of connecting you to other potential um, partners. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, again, I just want to echo uh, Liju's appreciation for all the pan panelists, Kyle, uh, Rochelle, Lisa. Thanks for the incredible insights and, and, and your time and generosity uh, in, in sharing your experience. Um, I'd like to I'd like to now to move on just to, to close up uh, our, our launch event and tell you a bit more about meaningful work and um, what we are uh, what we're doing um, to to kind of wrap up around skill based volunteering. So I will share my screen once again. Awesome. Um, and I'm good to go here. Cool. So um, I think one of the one of the questions that that was asked was around skill based volunteering and, and what 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 does that mean? So uh, we've looked at a resource uh, called capacitycommons.org and I'd really encourage you to check it out. It's it's a great resource and it, it walks you through the step by step process of uh, onboarding skill based volunteering uh, into your organization and it's really aligning people's service abilities uh, and with the tasks or issues that they're most qualified to address. So basically giving what they're good at or excel at. And, and this really increases the value of volunteers' time and potential impact um, up to, in terms of monetary values, if you were to compare this versus uh, consulting uh, hours, it would be up to a 10 times uh, increase in terms of monetary value. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, it's, it's not just the monetary value, it's, it's the connection, it's, it's the deepening of purpose and, and, and the feeling that you can have a real big impact with your skills. So how do organizations engage skill-based volunteering or skilled volunteers? We've identified six steps for success. First is to prepare your organization, uh, really look at the gaps within, within the organization and make sure you're ready uh, and have the capacity to take on a volunteer. Next is scoping the opportunity. That also takes a deeper look into what are the parts of your strategy or operation or implementation plan that might be missing or could help. Um, not just uh, to, to fill in, but also to uh, from a professional development perspective for your staff. Then it's to source the volunteer or the team of volunteers, um, implement the project or advising sessions, and evaluate the results. Finally, uh, it's really important to celebrate the impact and repeat this process. Um, I want to talk a bit about point three, which is sourcing opportunities, and, and there's many ways to do this. Uh, we find one way is to make a posting on your website and share it through social media. Uh, this can be time consuming and with, without too much exposure as well. So keep this in mind. One of them is to reach out to companies and, and, and for those who had existing relationships, it's a great place to go to. If you don't have those existing relationships, it can be difficult. Um, we know it because we do this every day, um, but, but there are some great companies out there that, that do offer time for their employees to volunteer. Um, go volunteer. Uh, .ca. It's uh, another great website. Uh, it's a $200 yearly membership to Vantage Point, which is another great organization uh, that helps with organizational capacity building. Um, and Go Volunteer is a good good website. Um, however, it's, it's very broad, so it's not specific to skill-based volunteering. Um, there's Catch a Fire, which is also another cool resource. However, they're based in the US, and it's a $2,000 per year membership for nonprofits. And finally, meaningful work. And I'll, I'll just touch a bit more about uh, what meaningful work is and what we can do for nonprofits. Um, why meaningful work? It's free for nonprofits, uh, free for, for volunteers. And uh, we do charge uh, companies, but not yet. Uh, it'll be after our sort of soft launch uh, free trial period. Um, but yeah, it will be continued to be free for nonprofits uh, because we do believe in supporting the community and, and removing barriers to creating impact. Um, 
there's a big focus on skill-based volunteering. So you can enter in the skills that you want to work on. We have great templates that you can align your projects with. And, and we do screen for the applicants to ensure that they are actually qualified uh, to perform in some of the roles that you would like. Um, it's part of a community. So this event here is one great example of people coming together, discussing uh, issues that they have in their organization and, and coming up with really creative solutions. So by joining Meaningful Work, you can connect with other organizations, you can connect with nonprofits, connect with companies on the platform. And um, one of the, the big draws is more events like these that we will continue to host and, and build a community around increasing your capacities as organizations. Um, we offer end-to-end -end support, so sourcing the opportunity, posting it, measuring the impact. And finally, uh, our mission and values. I think one of one thing that really we try to promote is purposeful connections, uh, engaging not just volunteers, but companies, and also helping uh, volunteers feel part of the causes that you champion. champion. Uh, some of the values that we, we hold dear is being human centric with our with our product development, as well as intersectional sustainability, and, and looking deeply at at the systems that that we continue to 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 build and um, preserve, and looking really critically at ways we can improve it. And we also love to uh, empower your organization's mission and values th through our through our um, platform. What meaningful work can do for a nonprofit is really supporting from A to Z in terms of building that volunteer platform, uh, volunteer, skilled volunteer pipeline. So first defining areas of need um, through a worksheet or checklist that we will actually provide at the end of the, the event, being able to set scopes, timelines and deliverables right from the get-go. And we do this through templates, which are on the platform and then getting the support that you need. So building up a volunteer base uh, from uh, professional networks and companies of employees with employee volunteer hours to spare. Uh, and finally, being able to interview those volunteers to make sure that they're the best fit uh, for your organization through a feasibility call. And then managing volunteers and determining the value of their contribution and, and recognizing that. And we have this uh, tracking progress feature so you can track the hours and the impact. Uh, and finally, it's celebrating and measuring that impact. So we have impact stories at the end of each opportunity where you can talk about what the volunteer has done for your organization and, and what they've learned. And also we offer workshops to help nonprofits uh, map their impact. And we're currently offering those for free. And we've come up with a, a mapping uh, mechanism that combines the theory of change and the UN SDG goals, UN Sustainable Development Goals to better communicate your impact. Um, so a few types of opportunities you could post, strategic advising, which gives you two hours with an expert that, that Lisa was mentioning, uh, which is looking for uh, a digital marketing uh, strategist to, to, to run her, uh, to give insightful advice on, on her next campaign and, and transforming her organization from the digital marketing perspective. Uh, there's projects uh, which could be more implementation-based events. So if, for example, if Rochelle were to, to hold, host a fundraising gala for Spark, it could be a one-time event with specific roles uh, on that day, perhaps keynote speakers. And finally, board and community members and, and committee members, and these are more for a long-term commitment over the, the course of the year. Um, so moving away from this session, we're almost wrapping up. Some reflection questions I have for you are, where are your biggest gaps in capacity? Where do you see potential projects? And how might working with companies look like for your organization moving forwards? There's many ways to look at these from different lenses. Uh, you can look at it from an operational perspective, looking at the key operations in your organization, whether that be people, data management, metrics and reporting um, from this framework. You could also look at it more so from a role perspective. So your finance person and someone who's working on impact measurement or human resources, uh, what do they need to, to succeed? And, and where can you grow that capacity? Um, Many different ways to look at it, but these are some examples of projects or advising sessions that you could post on Meaningful Work. Um, so went over that really quickly. We will have a resource guide with all that information that we will send afterwards. Um, but for right now, I think the next steps really, uh, if you would like to engage with the platform and check it out, we would love that. You can create an account at app.meaningfulwork.xyz or app.meaningfultech.ca. Uh, sometimes the XYZ domain is blocked, so we have a .ca domain as well. Um, Definitely review the skill-based volunteering toolkit at cassiecommons.org. Stay tuned for a recording, worksheet and checklist, and an invitation to book an impact mapping, mapping workshop with us. And we'll also do a similar event as we did today, but for volunteers and companies in two weeks. 
And finally, uh, make sure to follow the Orbis, Orbis Canada, the Starfish Canada and Spark Foundation on social media. We'll send you all of that information as well as meaningful work. So I would really like to, to thank you on behalf of the team uh, for attending this, our launch event. Really uh, grateful for all your support and really look forward to hearing from you. I know we're approaching the end of our event, 12 o'clock. Um, so you feel free to go and um, we'll be in touch via email. If you'd like to stay and, and uh, ask a few questions uh, and get to know each other, feel free to stick around and chat. But thank you so much uh, for being here today. And we look forward to creating deeper impact with you.